Hello and welcome to this special event organized by the Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra and Hong Kong Baptist University Academy of Music. So we're right now in Baptist U with a lot of students and music students here uh, with this special event and thank you for um, Academy of Music to hosting this event with us. Very special because we are now uh, talking with a, oh, I think that the topic is a little bit quite unusual, not only to the music student, but also to us uh, uh, running an orchestra because we are talking about game music and specifically open world game music design. Okay, the reason of course is because Elias is with us. Um, uh, Elias Leung will be premiering the uh, Metaverse Symphony on the May 5th and the 6th in three concerts uh, at Hong Kong Cultural Center. And the title of course is Metaverse Symphony and during our talks with uh, Elias, um, who has been not only a, a the one of the very first uh, Hollywood Hong Kong born composer, but also a A grade game studio designer of designing game music and open world game music that is under his t under his belt. And when we talk about the Metaverse Symphony's conception, it somehow begins with a conversation that when orchestral music comes from orchestra, symphony, then it goes to film music, uh, award-winning film music, like Elias has, has been doing quite a lot already. Then it goes into another media, it's called open world game. It's quite a different genre and quite a lot of different design. And then to the metaverse, because the metaverse, inside the metaverse, the user or the audience has the complete control over the avatar. And so as a musician or as a, a composer, how would you design your music and how would you organize your structure and most of importantly, how can you converse with the game designer or or the producer? That's a totally new regime of knowledge. So um, we are so happy to have Elliot here to share well his experience. Without further ado, let's welcome Elliot Learn. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. And uh, well, Dennis gave me a very, very nice introduction, so I don't need to speak about myself. Uh, but um, I think what's important to know about um, why w orchestral music is at the place of where we are now, I think um, when we look at classical music um, throughout, the, through the ages, throughout the ages, based on the, the place that houses the music, uh, music has evolved throughout that timeline. We had we had the church that housed the Gregorian chant, and then Schubert was writing chamber music in his own little household. And based on the venue and the place where music was created, music has evolved. And soon later came, you know, the Wagnerian operas. You had the opera, and then you had ballets in Paris, and then then you have film, video games, and now we have the metaverse. So then, I thought um, in the work I did for designing music for open world games, that really led me to continue venturing forward and when the metaverse space became available I wanted to chart into it but um, before I get to that uh, I'm going to be talking about open world games today which is uh, quite this expansive universe that has probably exploded over COVID <laughs> because everyone is stuck at home and they spend a lot of time playing video games um, um, I uh, am very fortunate to be able to speak on this because my mentor, who was the composer of a very best-selling video game by the name of Halo, uh, was able to teach me a lot of his tips and tricks before he retired. And so he was one of the person, one of the guys who pioneered this genre, which is called um, adaptive audio. So um, I'm, I'm what I, this talk will be structured in a way where I will talk about some technical aspects, both musically and, and in the world of video game coding. Uh, and then after that, I have not done this before, I will be turning on the Xbox and I'll be playing. And actually, if any one of you play the Xbox, it would be very helpful for you to play for me so I can talk. But anyway, I will be showing you a demonstration live and I'll be talking over it with no control because I cannot control what happens in an open world game. So, but anyway, before we get to that, uh, for us to understand that demonstration, we need to, I, I'm here to tell you a few things. First of all, the most importantly, what adaptive audio is. So in a nutshell, adaptive audio is audio that adapts to the environment you are in, especially in, so in a video game environment where everything is virtual. Uh, you, you would be 
going into different locations and different time of the day, and you cannot control what happens uh, within an environment. There are many, if a game is, uh, say, an, an AAA studio produced game, say Skyrim, which I will play in a bit, um, there are many things that could happen in, in an environment uh, where, which, which we call random encounters. So things just kind of pop up. Uh, it rains, uh, a guy falls in front of you, starts shooting you, and there are a lot of this, these variabilities that, that if you write music in a linear way, you cannot be able to accommodate with all these things that happen. So before we, I go into uh, adaptive audio, clearly adaptive audio is not linear, and everyone I'm sure knows what linear audio is. Linear audio just means an audio recording that starts from point A and goes to point B and it ends. That's linear audio, and that's used, and uh, that this linear model is used al in all film scores. And any film that exists now uses the model of linear, uh, linear audio because you put audio into an editing timeline and time just flows. Uh, you, will not ha you won't, ha at any point in the film, you won't have the timeline go back here, jump over here, go back to the beginning, and that does not happen. But in the, mod in the model of adaptive au audio, that can all happen. You can have a piece of music, and you could be jumping to point C, point you name it, or you can jump from piece to piece, and that. So what, what is good, what, why, why do we, we need adaptive audio in a game? It tells us many things. It's, first of all, it's more than just interactive. Sure, it's very interactive. It's very cool if you, in, in a game, and you step here, music changes, you step over here, music changes again, and if you keep doing this, it, I mean, kids who are five years old will find that very interesting. Um, but it's more than just that because um, interactive music is not engaging enough. Um, uh, in the Metaverse Symphony, we were working with an artist called Henry, and he, he creates interactive art. So what interactive art is, if, if I have this kind of, say, like a screen in front of me, and the art mirrors my hand, so if I wave my hand up and like some lines will go up, audiences will probably engage be maybe an hour. They'll be like, okay, it, it, looks, it reacts to my hand, okay, done, and then they'll leave. So, the role of music in an interactive sense is more than just to tell audience, hey, it changes where you go. Because the, the content of the music, and this is where music composer's skill set comes in, is, is a lot of stuff, this stuff has to be imagined where a lot of kind of sonic information has to be delivered to the audience. For example, time of day. So what <laughs> in a specific location, you would have to tell them that, hey, we are now in daytime, we are in nighttime, we are in afternoon because there's no watch in the middle of in, in the game, and some events say in the game only happen at night. <laughs> so, so for the audience or for the user and the gamer to to be over here, and they ha would have to listen to the audio to the music because there's in the, in the game there's also no narrator like a film. Hey, it's nighttime. No one would do that. So, music has to have that role. Uh, there's also a lot of um, emo emotive language you have to tell in music. For example, if you go into uh, location, you encounter someone, who is this person, and what, what are the intentions? A lot of this stuff is conveyed through music, because again, the person's not going to raise a sign, I'm a bad guy, they're not going to do that, so music kind of have to, you have to tell that through music, and the good thing about telling that through music is that it can be done in such a nuanced and subtle way where, where some person, a person who comes out doesn't have to be, doesn't have to appear as a, as an antagonist right away, uh, there are many ways you can package your writing and um, uh, feed your, the users different clues as they find out and travel through the length of the game, they find out who this person is, something like that. So uh, the last one is this called aesthetic and environmental ev evolving. Let's talk about aesthetic first. Aesthetic is purely a creative choice. Uh, it's when I, as a creator, want the music to sound better over time. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it, it doesn't feed any information such as, I'm in this location A or B. It's just, hey, I want to make my music sound as best as it can. If I were to stay in this location for five minutes and just listen to the music, which is now very common, people do that in open world games. <laughs> uh, environmental evolving is if something in a given location or environment uh, changes, and I will demonstrate in the game in a bit. So uh, uh, an example with that would be, I let's say this room right now, I enter this room, and the audio in this room, the music tells me that, hey, I am now in this room. Whatever this audio is, it's up to you as a creator to design. 
and one of you decide to stand up and have a debate, like a very aggressive debate with me right now. And, and then so the music would have to change within this location because the room, the tone of the room has shifted. Uh, but I still have to let users know we are still within this room. So that's something we call environmental evolving. And lastly, this is a meme I really like. Why do I hear boss music? Um, it's when you, you encounter a villain or something and music changes very suddenly. Uh, and uh, this is, in, in video game terms, would be called boss music. <laughs> so um, the general premises of design, uh, we first have to, you as a creator, you identify the triggers. What the music has to change period in adaptive audio. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use adaptive audio to begin with because it doesn't, if, you, if you don't want anything to change, you can just write linear audio. So first of all, you need to identify what would make the music change. For example, I meet someone. Uh, the ceiling falls at this point. Someone says some kind of dialogue. Uh, you are super cool, music change, something like that. You know, it's mapped with dialogue. But these changes are mapped within the game. The game, uh, real, and well, if any one of you game, there is Unreal Engine Ys, and uh, we, before, like 10, 20 years ago, we used Fmod and all these kind of mapping and coding modules. Um, these things are very nice to know, but as a composer, you're not. No one expects you to like be as fast as someone who actually codes the game. Uh, you just kind of have to know how it works. So you just need to usually for when I write for a game, I just let coders and the developers know that, hey, I want this to trigger at this line and this phase. So labeling all that. And sometimes these are, most of the time actually, these, these choices of uh, changes are made by the player themselves because I as the player decide to go here and music changes rather, the, rather than the game pushes me here. But sometimes because say if it's some kind of online game, say um, a very popular one right, one right now, it's called uh, Genshin Impact, right? So in, in Genshin Impact, because it's this online game that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever, uh, to keep the users engaged, every now and then they will have some special events, say in Christmas, say in like Easter. And so these real-time events would trigger some kind of change as well. Uh, and this is where I will show examples very soon. It's something, and but it's very important, it's called vertical and horizontal sequencing. Um, horizontal sequencing is uh, more common now, I suppose. Horizontal sequencing, think about it as you know, one line drawn like this, and, and music would change. A piece of music would morph into another piece of music through maybe sometimes through a fade, through a composed transition, through something. Uh, it's much more common now, in the, I'd say, in the last 10 years after Skyrim came, came about. Uh, it's a model that really uh, that Jeremy really pushed through in, in Skyrim and a lot of these open world games that followed Skyrim fo followed suit. Vertical sequencing is a, it's a, goes back to maybe 20, 30 years ago. Well, my mentor started it. My mentor Marty started it. So vertical sequencing, like I said just now, was you have a piece and think about breaking the piece into maybe say three or four breakpoints. And within the ambience of a piece, something triggers, something, something's added in, something's taken out. So it's, it's a more macro and micro scale. Um, and uh, uh, there are many ways to trigger, trigger these kind of changes, like I said just now. Um, from, a, from a musical standpoint, you can trigger something from silence. From nothing to something is a very simple change. Uh, you could crossfade two pieces of music for, for musicians who don't know what crossfading is, it's just um, fading out one audio and fading in another piece of audio, so they kind of crossfade like an X. Uh, and the, the very clever one people do now is called some, what's something called a composed transition. A composed transition is uh, uh, a very, very short clip of audio, probably lasts about maybe 10 to 20 seconds at best. It's usually some kind of swell where it masks, instead of crossfading something, it masks the fade. And then the, the transition will put you into another, another piece of audio. Um, uh, most, most of the times, the, the gen, gen and, but a lot of people kind of have ways around it now. I say most of the time because I don't want to overgeneralize. And this really comes from how you design things as a creator. So, but most of the time, the, the general premise of the, of the piece is usually mapped, starts with some kind of ambience again, usually, and then you, you would start inserting different kinds of rhythmic pieces into it to, to have the piece take off. Uh, 
there are cases where this does not happen, and those are special cases because those are very well thought through, I, I think, because the, uh, to start a piece without the general ambience is usually much harder to let an audience know you're in a space. Um, so uh, uh, for everyone who's, I suppose that's everyone who's interested in music, let me briefly talk about the musical things you can do uh, since it's a music program. So um, um, when, we, when you fade some uh, two pieces of music in, in a horizontal sequence from piece A to piece B, usually composers would, um, would think of the tonal relationships or lack of, because you can, because say if you have two things that are um, in the same key, two pieces that are in the same key, uh, the fade obviously would be very seamless if they share the same tonic. Um, but if they don't, you would also create a very, very disjunct, uh, disjunct feeling, and it evolves very quickly. Um, uh, there is also a BPM match, usually, between these fades. If, again, if these are meant to be seamless fades, um, usually keys are matching, tonics are matching, BPMs are synchronized, usually. Uh, but unfortunately, in an open world game, uh, things don't usually go, plan go as planned like that because if you kind of let the person know, hey, you're going to go on this path, do this quest, this main thing, find this person, um, usually the chances are they won't do that. They will do everything else before they do that. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you, you, it's practically impossible to map this entire quest out into one horizontal sequence because you always go into a player's as a human being, when you're told to do something you likely won't <laughs> in a video game. Uh, and so when they decide to do other quests, then you're bleeding, and you ha you're bleeding into the, other other, the music of the other quest line. Uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, c very clearly, de clearly defining your tonal relationships usually matters a lot. Um, and uh, knowing how to interject between uh, two pieces with maybe say a composed transition. Sometimes the composed transition could be um, a swell, a massive symbol swell, or it could be a phrase. Take this somewhere here. Uh, uh, a, a game that does that very well is Breath of the Wild, uh, Legend of Zelda, uh, and uh, uh, they they utilize a lot of woodwinds to to take you from place to place to place. But people, when you play, you don't really realize, you don't really recognize it. So for everyone who games and has a habit of gaming, go home tonight and just try to notice when the music changes because you learn a lot. Uh, so uh, very, very quickly, um, this is uh, usually how a horizontal sequence thing starts. You have an endpoint, you have a loop. The loop can go on for an infinite amount of time. And then there is a transition. This transition could be a fade, it could be, it could be a composed transition, it could be a sharp cut to a new piece, and then you could go into another loop or you could just completely stop it and have it out. So. Uh, let me give you a quick example of this uh, in Skyrim. So uh, let's start with ambience. <laughs> Except there's no sound. Is there sound? Ah, okay.
just now is these are two cues that share uh, the same tonal uh, relationship. They, it's in the key of G minor. Uh, and I started the ambient cue. And uh, at any point, I did not rehearse this. <laughs> uh, uh, I pressed this play because something happens, and I faded that away. Uh, uh, and this could have went on. I just decided to fade it away because maybe the player is now very engaged in combat. But I could keep this going, um, and it doesn't matter. So this is uh, uh, something that, that overlaps with a fade. Um, and uh, now this is vertical sequencing, which is a bit more complicated. <laughs> uh, so so the, the music starts over here. Uh, and then there, there's an endpoint, whatever it is, I punched someone, someone said a line. Music starts, and then the loop starts playing, the, the first loop. At some point in the first loop that starts playing, something happens again that triggers another loop. And then so both of these loops are now playing at the same time. But however, the tricky part is, it has to be designed in a way where this second loop can start at any point in this loop, and it has to make musical sense. And that's the very tricky part, and that takes a lot of design, which I, I will take a volunteer later, actually, because so, you will press play instead of me, so you will know that it, I'm not rehearsing it. <laughs> um, and if you, if you uh, want to take it even further, then this loop can, can stop playing at any time. It will trigger another loop, and this, this is just a cycle that can keep going forever and ever and ever, until uh, the scene ends, that you leave this location, you, the event ends, and then they will both finish. They'll bo they both exit. So uh, again, if you want to take this model even further, this thing can be duplicated into another thing down here. So uh, as much as you love to, if you're super obsessed with it, it can have many, many different layers triggered, which I will again show you in a bit. <laughs> uh, and this is usually used in open world uh, uh, combat games. I don't want to use the word violence, but combat <laughs> games. Uh, because you're en you enter a location and some kind of uh, danger or um, presents itself, but it doesn't present itself right away because you have to say, you have to look for it. Uh, you have to enter a certain spot on the map. If any one of you play Call of Duty or something, uh, you, go, you go to some place in the map, you call, you call or ordinance, it falls down, boom. Ordinance falls down, your RPG falls in, you pick it up, and then it starts playing. Uh, but this is the model, so if you want to take a picture, now's the chance, and because I will go into the next slide. So uh, I will now take a volunteer, somebody, please, because I want you to press play instead of me, <laughs> please, <laughs> somebody. All right, nice. So, okay, so um, again, this is an ambient track. We are now in the realm of vertical synchronization. So I, I, I just want you to press play on the ambient. You just, all you need to do is hover and press play here. And then at any point you want, right. you can press rhythm, rhythm okay? <laughs> Tell me when to play and I'll play it. <laughs> <laughs>
for you, for you to see how it would make sense in a different location. this works uh, for, for the very nerdy musical people is because um, I am just basically shifting my dominance, uh, my, not, not dominance, dominant. <laughs> uh, and I'm just centering, uh, uh, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a tritone relationship between these two things. Uh, and, uh, and so when, when the ambient plays, um, there is no, there is a kind of false sense of tonality that's established because I didn't really define anything yet. <laughs> uh, and when, I d and I, when, when this is very clearly grounded in, on, on the note D, then okay, now this is the tonic. Uh, so this is why it, it works like that. And because the drone D, again, because it's a drone, it's a pedal tone, uh, uh, the, the drone just works with literally any note in the scale. Uh, I think this is in Phrygin. Um, so then, um, when, when I pair the tonic with any note in the Phrygian scale, it just kind of, it drones there, and whatever the Phrygian scale does will do what it, it, its thing. Uh, and uh, because there's a rhythmic element here, then uh, again, whenever the player encounters something in this environment, this will play and it will make complete musical sense. So, uh, here's an even more elaborate example, <laughs> uh, where we will start with, again, I'll, I'll trigger this this time. There is an ambience, because we're in some location, uh, there, this time, rather than a synth part, is there's a percussion part. Um, and I have three options here of another real-time event that may occur. Uh, but to get here, I have a composed transition. So the mapping of this, if you can picture the little diagram I just showed you, this is in, we go in from here. And then this is an, the first out loop, the first layer, and we, we, we're now in this infinite circle. But then, Another real-time event happens, so there's the transition, which is now a composed transition rather than a crossfade. The composed transition takes me into one of these three options because I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and so, which is why when I record for a video game, which I will do that again, I'm writing for a play, oh, I can, actually I can say it. It's a PlayStation game and another shooter called Six Days in Fallujah. It's out next year. And when I write for a game like that, we record about four hours of music because of stuff like this. <laughs> and players, be, why players play it multiple times is because usually in one playthrough, you won't experience everything in the game. If you play any kind of video game ever, you would know that. So you have to play it multiple times because it could have multiple endings. And because there are multiple endings, you have different options. So without further ado, let's dive into this. So let's start with the ambience again. <laughs>
you get the idea. That's how involved some location or environment could be, and uh, this is not even the extent of it. This is uh, usually in, in any kind of open world given location, we would have maybe at up to maybe 10 options <laughs> down here <laughs> uh, because of the, the things that would come up. So, uh, Dennis, how much time do I have? Okay, great. I will now go into a game. Uh, so, uh, let me turn this, <laughs> turn my controller on. Uh, this is Halo. Okay, let's start with Halo. Uh, because it's a game I know the know, know the most. Yes, it's on easy because I don't want to die, and uh, <laughs> uh, unless someone wants to play, and we can play on difficult. Anyway, um, let. shoot down attempts are likely, so keep your distance. Yes, sir. Let's stay focused. Watch your sectors. There's the communications outpost. We're gonna distress beacon. It goes out, and the content of the music. Am I blocking you? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Okay, Could be sure, the missing let's troopers. Right let's check it out. Okay. Put us down on the bluff. I want your eyes on the sky. Sir. Let's go, Six. All right, Noble Team, spread out. Watch the approach. The stress beacon's coming from just south of your commander. We're close. Roger that. Eyes peeled. Structure point three four looks clear from this angle. So we're in this expansive kind of open world um, tone setting place right now. Smoke at the next um, structure, boss. Circle Ambient west and check it out. Old 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 you have permission to engage. Um, uh, <laughs> no need to telegraph or press. A bit full, a bit full. And so we're, we're trying to, the game is taking us into a deeper place right now. You know, it's, it's, uh, as a Spartan, that's what I am. I have a few teammates with me, and um, there's a threat on this planet. We are discovering, we're trying to discover the threat, but we don't know where it is yet. Noble Six, move into the house. Go in quiet, right behind you. Oh. On your knees, now! They're not rebels, they're farmers. Look at them. Ask them what they're doing here. Mit krest de kit. Mak nem ar kartok min honli. Hiding, sir. Take nap adyem, as som se dot isha chod ladyata. She called us... Neighbors were attacked last night. He heard screams. Gunfire. Stopped around sunrise. Says something in the fields killed his son. Something. Commander, be advised, I'm reading heat signatures in that structure directly east of your position. Over. Copy that. Get them back inside. Osman Tom Beffoli. Get him? Noble team, double time it. I took a very long time un unintentionally just now. <laughs> um, Damn. Uh, but it has uh, adapted the rate of the, uh, where we are. We've got military casualties, two of the missing troopers. Looks like they were interrogated. It's messy. So now that we have entered a place, we found a clue. The rhythm loop has disappeared. Uh, until we find Ooh. another. Watch your motion tracks. Uh, we find another threat. What the hell is that? June, you see anything? Negative. Thermal's clean. 
notice the ambient loop is still playing. It has been playing this whole time. Boss, I see movement outside your structure. Noble 2, move up to the west. We're about to be flanked. Huh? Damn it! Covenant! Contact, contact! Spartans, assist! Here we go. Okay, so here's the first team of combat, that's base. how I do. So in this team of combat, the devs decided that they would use sound effects instead of music because it's the first Thank time you would use a gun. So, so the transition here is silent, where um, music has completely dropped. And hold on, let me get through this first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think we're okay. I have great teammates. <laughs> so we keep going, I I'm think. Under fire. Notice how the music comes in after. Noble leader, enemy dropships inbound. Falcon, moving to assist. on the ground. We'll meet you at the outpost. Noble 3, requesting airlift. Over. Get to work, Noble. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> so, in the short lit to demonstration where I struggled <laughs> just now, <laughs> Uh, we saw many things there. Um, we, you were able to see how um, uh, the, the, the rhythm loop was triggered in, in the real-time event in the location. Uh, again, that could not be planned because I could not find my way. Uh, and uh, you saw how uh, a piece of music was triggered from nothing, uh, triggered from silence and triggered from effects. And all of these pieces are share very, same, the same tonal relationship in a, in a modal scale is on for Jin. Uh, the, the ambience, the, 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 the notes in the rhythm loop, and also the uh, combat uh, loop. We're all sharing all of that that describes this world they were building. Uh, am I out of time? Uh, oh, it's OK. Perfect. Oh, OK. OK. Well, I wanted to show you guys Skyrim, but I think you guys saw some of that before. Um, but Skyrim is the game that does the horizontal thing where it goes from piece to piece to piece to piece. Uh, this is a more complicated mod, though, so I decided to go with this one.
But anyway, I think it's we're doing the discussion now. Yeah. Okay, so Thank let's you. do that. <laughs> Thanks, Elliot. And can you, can you show back the screen for, for the PowerPoint for oh, me? Oh, yeah, sure. sure well, sure. thank you, Elliot. And I think it's highly highly intellectual and also highly technical. But I would say that it is very close to us. And I have a quite a lot of questions to ask uh, okay. with Elliot. And, but may I take this time also to invite also Dr. Eugene Berman to, uh, well, let's have a talk with Elliot uh, together, and also we'll take some of the questions from the floor. And of course, um, th this is also live streamed on the uh, Hong Kong Harmonic Orchestra, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch, and also the Atlantic University Academy of Music YouTube also. So if there's any question, we'll try to take also the questions from the internet. So maybe we let's let's get let's get seated. Okay. Thank you. Please, please, please. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and let's have a mic for Dr. Berman also. And so, um, uh, uh, we we also take a little bit questions from the floor with the uh, with all of our students here. Uh, but let me begin with the first question. Mm. Uh, well. <laughs> Okay, as, a, as, a, as, as an orchestral music lover, and also mm -hmm. as a gamer myself also, mm -hmm. um, when we try to uh, learn a new thing, like learn a new music, we usually listen to the music, or we usually try to appreciate that. But me right now is that, okay, I'm so busy, I'm playing with the game, and then I have to destructure de everything <laughs> with that. I mean, this is already, I mean, I mean, I'm so busy with playing the game. And as a like as a as a as an interested student, mm. how how would you advise them to begin with? <laughs> like focus on playing the game first, or focus on how you listen to the music, because the music is al is also distracted by quite a lot of things. Like for example, when you shoot, yeah. you have a lot of sounds happening. Yeah. Yeah. And so, how do you concentrate on the music, or how would you advise them to focus on the music when you play a game and when you want to? Know about the interaction. Play on easy. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, you should. Uh, I think um, while you might not be able to know the the content again of the music your first playthrough, your first or second playthrough, you won't be able to say, "Hey, that's a Phrygian scale. That's a that's a G minor chord." But the, I think one of the clearest things you would probably notice is, "Oh, it changed. It changed. Oh, it changed. Oh, it changed." Um, and that's usually the beginning to. To um, getting to know game music, of, of why it changed at this specific spot, um, it was something I did. So you become more self-aware. Like, oh, I pressed like if you're in Cooking Mama, oh, I put the beef in. Like, I <laughs> like something like that. Oh, oh, time is running out. So, so something about what you did or what the game's making you do or the environment, it's it's um, uh, kind of pushing for this change forward. So noticing the change. So one thing that you mentioned also, one thing you mentioned also earlier is about the trigger. So that's mm. the thing that you, you just mentioned also is about the trigger. Mm -hmm. And this is the to be sensitive about the trigger. But what about those triggers that is more subtle? Would, I, I think that would be like, because some of the subtle I mean uh, uh, trigger would be by design, like from the composer's point of view to hidden behind the surface. W yeah. w would you do that also? Yes, of course. Uh, I think um, in, in more um, open world games right now, um, I, I just finished one, it's called Dragon Air, uh, Silent God. So in, in a game like that, um, uh, I think from what, what a, sometimes I, I, as my, I can't speak for every composer, but myself as a composer, I find a lot of, a lot of joy when players don't notice music has changed because I've disguised it when you go seamlessly from one location to the other location, it means I did that change. I probably did that really well because, oh wait, it's two pieces of music, <laughs> and then then they go back to the album later. Oh wait, it's it's three pieces of music. That's always the joy of composer like Gustav Mahler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I would say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is a, the success of a composer by not letting you know that I I made something. Yeah. Are we in the fifth movement. What? <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of questions. Okay, great. Um, one is maybe at least a bit compositional, which is okay. when you when you think about the whole video game, right. which is 
effectively it's it's almost Wagnerian in its yeah. in its ambition yeah. actually. Uh -huh. uh, how do you think about the structure? Because actually it's you know uh, you, you do you think actually all the way through the end of the video game as the music develops, how do you how do you conceive of the piece of, of the piece of the video game as an entire thing, or do you think about chapters? How do you structure? Well, um, it's uh, I I I'm a bit of a nerd, so I usually like to pick my scales first. So I, def I define my tonality, um, and uh, so lear learn your scales. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I know where I want to go, and if I have if there are triggers that happen, I know where I can go. Um, so it's uh, it's it's something I do with writing anything really. Um, so in in say within the symphony, it would be um, the octaton scale, the Phrygian scale, the whole tone scale. So these scales that kind of inter interject within each other, they kind of interweave between each other because they share some notes in between. Um, so it's this kind of exercise I like to do. And then I would, um, so after I define my tonality, I, I start writing, like like you said, Wagnerian life to me. Um, because everything, every game needs to be anchored with um, an idea, with, um, with or maybe like two or three ideas in a very expansive game like we saw Halo just now. A, ga a game that, I think the speed run record is probably two hours, but that's like a, an expert. Normally people would spend about 50 hours on it. If they play the camp, and probably more if they play multiplayer, you know, they just endlessly, endlessly shoot with their friends. Um, but, um, you stretch it out actually, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So then, so then uh, how, how, how do you keep the, the players engaged? And one of the ways is uh, through, really through music. And it's, first of all, it's, um, it's fun to listen to and it's, it, Great for game identity, and Halo was really the one of the first games to, to that did that. Everyone back in the 2000s, all the men in the boys' bathroom would just sing the, oh, they would just sing all of that, and and, and any kind of echoey place. Just, yeah, yeah. The, acoustics, <laughs> the, the, the acoustics are good. Right, 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 right. Um, after that, I would go into the details of okay, hey, we have we have X number of locations. Sure. Here are the events and how we construct all of that. So it's kind of like a top-down approach. So you mentioned the Metaverse Symphony. We can talk about that for a little bit, right? Yeah, We're allowed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk about it in the sense that it is a symphony. Yes, it is a symphony. And, and actually, a lot of the music that that we heard already, it's symphony orchestra music. It's or symphonic. So, yeah, so yeah. all of this is informed in some way by mm -hmm. by you know uh, classical music. In, yeah, uh, yeah. In fact, it's it's truly informed by that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it's a completely different way of presenting it because mm -hmm. it's being presented in an interactive way, in a, in a, in a gaming way. Yep. Uh, or in the case of the Metaverse Symphony, it's presented in a different sort of uh, context and mm -hmm. world. Um, so I'm wondering if you can, if how do you see the the job of a composer or the craft of a composer evolving? Because now we're not just talking about writing a symphony right. number five, right, 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 um, right, right. but we're talking about writing a symphony which is sort of controlled by the player in the video right. game, a symphony that is seen in a different world than the one that you know that the, the from the Hong Kong Cultural Center. Yeah. Um, where is that? going and how do you feel as, as part of it? Um, I'm, I'm going to try answer this question very, very responsibly. Um, and, uh, <laughs> because the future of music, I think, um, as, as it ha always has been in the past, um, technology or the advancement in society has always pushed music forward and has created new things that musicians can or cannot do. Um, take, you know, like, um, uh, the Schupfunk, the creation, the Haydn. Um, you know the clarinets are now part of the orchestra. Before that, you know quad clarinets, and then came the valve horn. Now you can do many things with the horn now. So, so then technology brings us to now we're in, in a day where, um, and you know, like a lot of the a lot of the guys maybe 50 years ago, Don Cage, Stockhausen, they were playing with a lot of chance music too. But then um, those were not interactive chance based music, I would say. Um, where Control. yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, again, this is uh, this would be me answering very irresponsibly. But if I try to be res responsible, I think in the in in a symphony like this, where I what I wanted to create was um, an environment where uh, some elements, because everything the musicians do on stage, again, um, because they they it's humanly impossible to play a piece the same way two times. Or th uh, it's just impossible. The vibrato to be off, your, your tonguing and your means, the, su the saliva you produce that day would definitely be different from the day yesterday. So we wanted to take these param parameters, capture it, and show it on the screen. 
um, everything, uh, the visuals you, you see, assuming if you come to the concert, but if you, if you, <laughs> if you, when you see the visuals on the screen, all of that is a real-time generation of what the music, musicians do on stage. And so, and the musical design of the piece, I created a lot of play. It's a lot of these kind of thought out of the page elements where you, you give them the parameters of, okay, you can play this pitch, this pitch, that pitch. Uh, you can play with this melody, and even even if some something as, as broad as the, the number of times you vibrate a string, all of that would be transmitted onto the onto the onto the screen. Um, and um, we thought that was um, a place where music could continue growing, as as like I said before, um, the different places that house symphonic music ha has been has a new place that could potentially house symphonic music has now presented itself. So just as the people in the past have done, I thought it was. I thought it was just logical to, hey, let's put a symphony into this space and see what comes out of it. And yeah, of course, because mm -hmm. fundamentally, a concert hall is a creation of, I mean, nineteenth century, right. the late nineteenth exactly, century, exactly. to house the, uh, an orchestra the size mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. a modern orchestra. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and Hong Kong has a venue problem. Always, we always want more venues, yes, more space. For sure, so for sure. So this gives another yeah, opportunity to, sure. to experience the work. Yeah, yeah. Um, should we maybe ask for some questions yeah, from the floor? So, so I'm yeah. sure there are lots of any any questions from the floor? Any questions from the internet? Yeah, please. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Elliot, for this uh, workshop. It's great. It's super interesting. Um, I'm just interested in what state the game is in when you start writing music. What? Uh, what state the game is in when you start writing music, like in development, mm. I mean. Because uh, some composers have a little bit of input on game design sometimes, and, oh, I want a music trigger here. Mm -hmm. um, it probably varies for you, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just wondering. For the projects I like to do, and I mostly do, I'm involved in the very beginning, um, because unlike a film, um, where uh, usually in the film scoring, usually, again, I don't want to generalize, but usually speaking, the composer belongs in what we call post-production, where everything is done, they present you the cut, and you do your work. However, a game is not structured that way. Production is not structured like um, a video game, I'm sorry, a, a film, because um, audio in a game um, is structured very differently. And because audio is structured differently, it's very important, in, in important for a composer to, first of all, know um, uh, whether there will be triggers or not. Sometimes you don't have triggers. And, and um, so that really informs you of how you would be writing. And so um, the game devs, I mean, most, I can't say all, but all the game devs I personally know want a composer to be involved in the very beginning because as they build the world, they, they can already put music in. And because a, ga a game is something you can test, you know, I, I play all the games I, I work on, even when they're in production, because in a way we can also test bugs that way, oh, you can't jump here, like things like that. Um, and then I can and see how the music is implemented in real time, and then so you can change things. And because there, um, games have only, like, as in open world games, have been only have been around for maybe the last 10, 20 years, maybe less than 20. So there hasn't been, like, unlike a film, there hasn't been a very clear defined process. Okay, we do this, and then now this, and then now this. So every, every gaming uh, company, PlayStation, Bethesda, Nintendo, they, they generally have the composer be involved in the beginning, but the, how they how the composer is involved varies, I guess. Um, in in the shooters and the, uh, the the games I've been with, because as you can see, like a shooter game just now, how how adaptable the audio is. So I I gen usually am involved when they hey we, we need music. This is what the game's about. Go ham. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Elliot. I was wondering, um, since with horizontal uh, writing, and I'm very new to this, I'm just mm -hmm. we've kind of showed here, you have to be very clever about making everything kind of melange together in a very nice way. Mm. Would you say that you have to write uh, melodically very different from um, vertical writing, the, for example, horizontal game? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Um, uh, I think um, when you write vertically, um, sometimes how should I answer? When you write vertically, like like the like Halo or say um, real time trigger events, the mel the melodies that are written are drone ish because they can exist on any plane. <coughs> 
So if you think about it, I mean, if you know the melody of Halo, it's a drone melody. It drones on E. So if you play, if you just play an E uh, rhythmic loop over it, this melody can exist on anything, and it can be triggered like that. Um, when you write um, horizontally, like you said, then you don't have to write in a in a drone way. Um, you can if you it's your creative choice, uh, but um, uh, it becomes more um, uh, versatile in the in the ways you can write as it cross fades into another. Um, I would say um, the the very the 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 best designs. This is my personal opinion <laughs> only. Um, the best designs in game audio in com in in music game music is the ones that are dronal in nature, mm -hmm. but you don't realize it's dronal, which is Halo, <laughs> uh, because um, uh, again, it's disguised in a way where you think you believe that oh it's so dynamic, but yeah. it's written with that in mind. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Do we have another question? Yeah. Think yeah. Um. So if if you're writing uh like game music for um open world games, uh, sorry uh -huh. open world games. Oh yeah. yeah so yeah. like um. How do you find the um, inspirations and creativity? Do you just like, um, I'm writing like music for um, Death Stranding, and I'm gonna buy a ticket to Norway and Switzerland. <laughs> Is it that, that how it works? Uh, I think it's actually, so the, the, the reason why I like writing for video games, specifically open world games, it's because it's usually very <laughs> open, no, no pun intended, um, but um, uh, because um, if you write for a specific time of day, you know, it's really up to you. There's no, hey, nighttime sounds like this, the morning sounds like this. Um, when you write for a shooter, um, you can obviously write for the events that are happening, or you can write about the psychological mindset of the guy who's shooting. Um, so the perspective is really entirely up to you. Um, um <clears throat> so in the game, say, Death Stranding, uh, do, would you want to go to Norway? Um, I, I don't think he went to Norway, but... Um, uh, <laughs> Because, I, again, I don't think you have to write about Norway. Um, you, uh, for people who don't know, Death Stranding is this game that takes place in the Nordic regions, or it's m made um, with that uh, influence. Um, it's really just how you, where you want to take the game. In. And um, so there's, because games have, are still t relatively new, there still hasn't been a right or wrong answer of how you should be doing it. There are preferences of, hey, I might, your team, hey, I think we could approach it this way. I think I could approach it this way, but that's always just a perspective and not, we. this is the way we're doing it. Um, because what's the theme of Halo? Halo is a game that shoots aliens in a native planet, and the theme's a Gregorian chant. So think about that. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that would be really like a, a composer's, I mean, the, uh, the creator's standpoint and also stylistic choice of um, what yeah. kind of mm -hmm. music and, or, and also the perspective of composer. Like, you take us from like the Breath of the Wild, you, 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 you take the geographical location quite seriously. Right, right. Yeah, but then right. you, if you are not, not like Halo, would be on the, on the mood or on the psychological effect. Right, 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 right. Because if you were really to write for a sci fi, I guess you would put a lot of like electronic sounds in it. Because if you were taking it literally, uh, which Marty did, I th probably the exact opposite because the Gregorian chant was not prop. I mean, we don't know what Mars sounds like, but surely it's not the Gregorian chant. <laughs> yeah, that's the question that I want to bring back to the symphony side. Because, okay. Uh, okay. This interesting thing that we are doing the Madhavan Symphony by Elias Leung, and then, and that you you pick. I mean, specifically picking a an a, an orchestra mm. like a Western orchestra. So. Um, and of course, there are music that I mean, game even in game music, we have a lot of orchestral, great orchestral game music. But still, you chose a a, a symphony orchestra as your mm. medium. So mm. why? Um, well, to again to answer it responsibly is because I like it. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. But <laughs> um, I think um, the orchestra. I grew up as an orchestral musician. I used to play the cello. Um, so I naturally am just drawn to the orchestra, and when I write for film, when I write for games, it's the medium I choose because I think, again, I think, as a composer, it lets me express myself in the most versatile ways. There are many ways for me to say something within the different options presented in an orchestra, the colors and the, the different um, uh, interactions between players. And so when I had to write for the metaverse, I think I just I just went back to a canvas that I know I I, I would was able to, you know, freely 
um, express things I want to say artistically in many different ways. And but who knows? Maybe the next symphony I'll do it electronically. Who knows? But <laughs> so if, okay, but if uh, there are students sitting here uh -huh. want to aspire, uh, uh -huh. oneself to be an orchestral composer, like like a symphony or even writing game music with, no with mm. orchestra. So mm. what's your advice for for these aspiring students? Um, listen, <laughs> There's listen to a lot of different music. Um, uh, if you want to write for games, uh, first of all, play games. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, because if you don't know how a game works, it's quite difficult to write for a game. Um, enjoy playing the games. I mean, I, I, I loved playing games, which is why I, I, I kind of just saw myself here. I just, I just combined the two things I really liked. And if I wasn't a game composer, I'd just be going to concerts in Hong Kong on Saturday, and in the daytime, I would just be playing games. So it's just nice to do the two things together. Um, but uh, it's the same for film. If you want to be a film composer, love film, watch a lot of film. Uh, because um, knowing a lot of music is kind of a given. <laughs> like, you should know a lot of music, and you should know how to kind of musically express yourself in a very original, or, or, or authentic way, is better way, uh, an authentic way. Um, but um, know how a game works again, because um, at the end of the day, you are writing for a, a still con relatively new medium that's um, not too kind of, it's not like a film where it's been around for a hundred years. So, yeah. So, listen, it's really quite the... Go to Hong Kong Film Concerts. Hong Kong yeah. concerts <laughs> of course. Um, and, and, of course, we have to promote because um, the Metaverse Symphony by Elliot will be on on May 5th the 6th. Actually, we have a trailer to a bit oh. of tasting what the Metaverse Symphony is on. So, please. You better get out of the way. No, no. <laughs> Are you playing it here? Are you playing it here? Yeah, as they're uh, playing okay. at the back. <laughs> okay. sit here to listen to a symphony. No, it's a symphony adapted within the metaverse. So it will be happening in the sandbox and released in summer, summertime. So after the world premiere of the concert, the recording will go on within the metaverse. So we have two parts of it. But of course, uh, May the concert will be happening and then you will have the chance to listen to that world premiere in time and in the first person still, I would say, say that first person is still very uh, important uh, in this world of um, all the game and virtual things. Mm -hmm. And so please join and please join us. And also if, if you're not here with us, if you are, if you are listening to the live stream, also you can buy the ticket at that text um, on yeah. 5th to 6th and to hear this world premiere of the symphony. So, and well, l let's pick a, give a big applause again to <laughs> Elliot. Um, and also, I wish the premiere of the symphony a great success. Um, and so, hope to see every one of you there in the Hong Kong Symphony, uh, Hong Kong F uh, Cultural Center, and then uh, in the in the metaverse. And, and thank you once again for Dr. Berman, thank Dr. Poon, and the Academy of Music of Hong Kong Baptist University sure. to host this event with us. And thank you. So, see you in the concert. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. yeah.